So the next little thin bookcase here in the middle um, continues European languages, other European languages, Slavic, and then other. So mm -hmm. for Slavic, um, might make more sense to have uh, old Church Slava up at the top because that's the oldest one that we know. But I start with Russian because they're oversized. Mm. So I've got some uh, lots of oh over on the side just because it, it's always a problem where to put Esperanto. I've got some Esperanto books over here before we do that. Then I got Russian. Um, so three cells of Russian because I think Russian is the most un unequivocally the most important Slavic language and it's the one I know best, the one I concentrated on, the one I've been to Russia to do a homestay and, and stayed with some people, so I've got all sorts of both books from Russia, Russia, Russian books, and Asimil and older books, so um, lots of stuff for Russian, and again, I've got lots of more literature, Russian literature upstairs. So Russian, I'm kind of like really on the threshold of, or have been on the threshold of truly being an independent reader, and uh, it's pretty exciting. And then on the basis of Russian, I've learned other languages. Um, so I have this wonderful book, A Guide to the uh, Slavonic Languages and the uh, Old Church Slavonic. Uh, old Bulgarian um, is kind of interesting, and Old Bulgarian segues into Modern Bulgarian, and then other Southern Slavic languages are Serbo-Croatian, and then Western Slavic languages are Czech and Polish. And Slavic is probably the... Um, the biggest and most important branch where I have the most, I'm, I'm most aware of big gaps. And I think part of that is the historical time. I, I'm not sure, again, when I was collecting in the late 90s, um, you know, the Iron Curtain hadn't fallen that recently before. And I'm not sure that there were, I don't have any books for Ukrainian or Macedonian or Bosnian or Slovenian or Sorbian or a host of others that I can name, and I'm not sure that there were books for those at that time. I, I know there are now, and I'd be happy to get them and add them to this collection. I don't know how this would expand, but um, yeah. So Slavic is, uh, I studied a lot of Russian, and I went and I did a homestay in Russia, and I had a strong base, and I was, in that time when I was collecting these books in Korea, I was uh, also studying a number pretty much all of these, Serbo-Croatian and Czech and, and Polish. And then I kind of decided that on the basis of what I was just telling you about learning a branch and knowing one really well, and before I go on, I thought it doesn't make us any, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to try to be learning four or five Slavic languages you know, at the same time. Let me really learn Russian as well as I possibly can, and then that, Russian, that knowledge will make it so much easier to, to learn the others. Um, so I, I think that is a, a good strategy. Um, Unfortunately for me, though, I've also, and apart from Russian, I've also got Arabic and Persian and all these other languages I'm learning, so I haven't been able to concentrate. But if I were to want to um, ever go back and really concentrate on Slavic languages, that would be what I would do. I would, I would have a massive uh, Russian improvement scheme and then turn what I know of Russian to the others. So from Russian, um, the Slavic languages are arguably, I guess I should have this... The Slavic languages are arguably related to the Baltic languages of Latvian, Lithuanian, and Old Prussian. And the only one I've really studied here is some Old Prussian, just because it's purely theoretical. And Latvian and Lithuanian are interesting. Lithuanian in particular, people say it's um, the most archaic and kind of related to Sanskrit, so I'm interested in it for that. Um, and then... What is this here? I guess because this is under European, this should be over here. This should be Albanian. And Albanian is... I've never studied these. I just have this in theory. Uh, it's its own language family within Indo-European. And, and talking about own language families, we've got Basque or Euskara, which is... Um, unidentified, or it's, it's, it's... People don't know what it might be related to, and there's some... I, at least one interesting hypothesis that it could be somehow related to Sumerian, which is kind of fascinating if there were anything to that. So I kind of have taken stabs at Bosque at several times. I never use this one, but I use both of these. This, which I like um, 
like Retro Romanche and like Frisian, I went to a Bosque Academy at one point and like that's where I got this and asked for help and uh, tried to do, you know, show that I was interested. But whereas with Frisian, they're perfectly happy to have you uh, and it's perfectly helpful to you to speak Dutch and they speak Frisian and with uh, Retro Manche, it's, I spoke Italian and they spoke Retro Manche to me and you could kind of train to convert them. Um, trying to speak Spanish and convert it to Bas doesn't work very well, so um, I, didn't, I didn't get very far with that. But that was interesting but abortive. Um, and then going into the Uralic languages, we've got uh, Hungarian and Estonian here. And then um, Hungarian, Estonian, and Finnish. And now I give Finnish its own shelf because I did the experiment here at, at Concordia Language Villages of doing a two-week immersion in Finnish, and I got a lot of this stuff there because of that, and uh, had that experience of um, learning Finnish really intensively in, in sort of like the ideal learning circumstances. Uh, you know, t people there, all, all the teachers were like... When you go to a country to try to learn language, you're just interacting with the people. They're not there to help you learn the language. Whereas in this village, there were you know Finnish teachers of Finnish as a foreign language who were there to help you do it, and and so I was like able to really you know study grammar on my own and then go out and apply what I learned and listen to them. And so I learned an amazing amount in two weeks and subsequently have forgotten it because I wasn't interested in it in the first place and mm -hmm. I didn't follow up on it and I didn't do it, but. You know, it's it's finishes has a reputation for being very difficult and very different, but in point of fact, I found it to be amazingly similar to Korean, in the grammatical structure, um, and so um, by preparing phrases ahead of time and speaking with somebody who was interested in helping me speak it, you know, I was able to get you know functionally, you know, stumblingly conversational in a very short time. Or how often is it that your study of a uh one language benefits a, a totally unrelated language? Um, I would say always. Always? You know, um, not necessarily directly, but, mm. you know, just the, the more you know of languages and how they work, I think we have language with a capital L is, is, is sort of like the platonic ideal, you know, the, the original language and all these languages are just reflections of that. So the more of these languages you know, the more perspectives you can see that from and, and the closer you can understand it. Um, mm -hmm. To this degree, that, like I said, that you know, I found that Finnish uh, was helped by my knowledge of Korean. Uh, that was kind of a, I don't want to say a fluke, but I know that Korean linguists, some people say that Korean and Japanese are isolates, uh, whereas Koreans are perfectly convinced that their language is, is Ural Altaic and, and so is this here. So mm. um, it's it's not so surprising. So okay. um, you know I wouldn't say that my my knowledge of Korean helped me, you know, with Arabic the way it helped me with Finnish, but you know, the fact that I had learned a, a difficult, you know, utterly different language even though it had no relationship to Arabic, so that, that certainly helped me learn another difficult uh, utterly unrelated, you know, language with different etymology and structure.